What's up? <laughs> Hello, this is Stacy Sims and the Millennium. <laughs> oh, there's so many funny ones. I think I should wear um, this one for the recording. Great. So what did you want to say that was very important? <laughs> That when you do so many Zoom meetings, it's super fun to make fun of yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're fun. I, I love that they, they are managing to implement some like fun into like the business tools. I know, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Except if we had a whole bunch of researchers on a call and the one that was leading it isn't really Zoom savvy, but we were changing like glasses and everything. And we we're just cracking each other up, but we were all on mute and he couldn't hear. He had no idea what's going on. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So we decided we'd do that. Yeah. But um, yeah, so topic is... Uh basically uh i guess one thing that was interesting is like i think wearables are getting better and it's it's good uh, mm -hmm. but also still like i think what you were saying is although they are like the last thing that aura added it was uh being able to uh, predict uh periods and uh and i think like although they are going towards uh something that serves women they also don't seem to to cover the full spectrum of what is a woman which is if you are taking contraceptive you probably it doesn't probably uh, relate to you if you are in perimenopause same if you are like so all these different uh, uh life stages where women actually are very frequently um right. like a massive uh, 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 part of the population so i guess maybe like that could be a topic mm -hmm. um and then uh and yeah uh, so we can we put stuff on that. Do, do, what do you think? Do you have any other thoughts or other, other things you want to talk about? Well, part of it is I feel like everyone's jumping on the buzzword. Like now we have, like we have wild, for example, right? It's not a buzzword, <clears throat> right? It is actually yeah. really put together with lots of research and thought, and it's there to empower women and women learning about their own cycles. But now you have all these um, big wearable devices that are backed by big companies. And they're hearing the outcry of women. And what about us when we want to know about our menstrual cycle, right? And so yeah. now they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll put a toggle button on the app where you can say yes or no, or we'll put in a temperature sensor and we'll be able to see when you ovulate, but it's not sensitive enough. So they're, I don't know if they're just trying to placate the, greater population or if they actually have plans to push it forward and put some good insight and research behind it. Mm. And that's what worries me. That's yeah. what worries me because there's already so much misinformation out there. So if you have something like Aura that's using temperature around the finger and it's only one temperature site and it's not necessarily looking at um, blood volume or like circulatory shifts and having other, other temperature measurements, then it's not really telling. It's not going to give an accurate prediction of what's going on for that woman. And that's what really worries me because they'll put out all this information, but they don't have the technology or really the science to back up what they're trying to push out. Mm. And do you think like, I mean, uh, I mean, when we both know like some people there and clearly like there is a, a desire to like push women, but it also can okay. come from a few women within the team, but then like, higher level is, is is just like marketing buzzwords but um, yeah. um i mean it would be pity if they didn't realize it is a massive business opportunity right yeah. so like whoop has a new women's collective yeah and their goal is to do research on women so it's not necessarily about tracking the menstrual cycle but it, they actually have from the top down some funding to really push to go after some of these questions that weren't answered or aren't answered. So they have like physicians, they have athletes, they have physiologists all working together collaboratively to figure out what are the big rock questions. So that I can get behind, obviously, because I'm part of that collective. But if it's just putting a trend into an app and trying to placate it because, you know, the top management is like, yeah, it might be a good idea, but we don't know, then that's what worries me. 
And uh, what about the new like body temperature tracker of Whoop? Yeah, I haven't seen the validation papers on that. Yeah. When I look into the research and they're looking at um, like, I know Aura has a few and they're like Fitbit and some other wrist-based yeah. temperature measurements. They're trying to validate, but there is an error within it. Like there's a huge margin of error between what is actually going on with pore temperature versus what skin temperature is doing. Mm. And in order to make it super valid, you have to have more than one site. But between ring and wrist, the wrist is better if it's appropriately placed because it also picks up blood flow changes. So you'll get that temperature and blood flow changes, which is akin to two sites rather than just one. But it's still not, it's not going to be able to predict ovulation. It's not sensitive enough. It's not going to tell you when all of a sudden your core temperature is up and then drops because you really need basal body temperature, which is a very, very finite um, increment and drop. Mm. And you also, if you're going to really track it, you need more than just that one site. Yeah. And I think um, one thing that you were talking about is this actually seeing in the graph. So could you like talk a bit more about like actually what is happening in the body and uh, body basal temperature and how, oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, in the, when we look about the menstrual cycle phases, in the low hormone phase, body temperature sits what, 37, 37, 37.5 as a baseline temperature. Around ovulation with the estrogen surge, it drops by maybe, 0.3 degrees C, so you'll see a fluctuation mm -hmm. down, but it's only 0.3, so a normal yeah. thermometer won't pick that up. And then after ovulation, as court, as um, progesterone starts to come up, then you have an increase of 0.5 degrees C from that initial baseline. So you're not paying attention to the ovulatory temperature from follicular phase baseline. And 0.5 isn't that big of a jump either. So it's a finite, that's why you need to use a specific basal body temperature thermometer and not just a general thermometer. Um, and so that gives you an indication that your hormones are working. So you have a downward shift from the estrogen surge, starts to come back up to normal, and then you'll see a definitive rise that gets held for about 10 days, and that's progesterone taking over. So that's why we're saying, you know, like from a fertility aspect, when people are trying to track their cycle and find um, the point of ovulation, you really do need to use the basal body temperature thermometer because it's such a small, small increments to be able to track it. The one that you can detect the best is it because it's minus 0 0.3 and then plus 0.5. So it's like a differential of 0 0.8, right? Yep. At that moment, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and like the science behind the wrist and the the finger uh, temperature trackers, like what uh, like how does it get, like potentially works and why is it like so different than uh, body basal temperature? It, does it take into consideration like first if you have your hand under like duvet in your bed, does it impact it? Yes, the skin temperature takes on the ambient temperature, so it's a reflective of what's happening from the outside in, it's not a reflective of what's happening from the inside out. So even when we're doing thermoregulatory studies, we have a core temperature that's either esophageal, so the thermistor goes up the nose down to the level of the heart, or rectal thermistor, so you can actually get internal deep core temperature. And then you also have skin temperature on top. And the differential is huge. Like we'll mm. see there's a significant drop in skin temperature right before the onset of sweating and then it starts to come up again because you have blood flow shifts. So they're taking it on the idea of skin temperature, but when you look at their validation papers, they're using a six site skin temperature um, as their like true in lab sites versus their one site where they have on the finger or the wrist and they're trying to validate against it. But each room, when I've been reading validation temperatures, the environmental conditions are different between the rooms. Mm. So you couldn't even compare ring to wrist because you have these differences in the environmental temperature around the person. So it's interesting with thermoreg because what skin temperature reflects is vasoconstriction, vasodilation. So blood is taken away from the skin and then it's brought to the skin when you're hot. But when you are looking at what happens 
across the menstrual phase, when you have that uprise of progesterone, you also have shifts in your thresholds. So there's a different, different response of constriction vaso and dilation according to your internal temperature because your body is like, okay, I got to compensate for this. So that's another reason why I get frustrated when people are looking from the outside in to be able to predict something that really should be from the inside out. Mm. Yeah, so basically like all these devices today can't really predict uh, peers and ovulation based on these body temperature variations. It just layers on what someone, like it would be cool if they were to take that and layer it into what Wild's doing, where a woman's putting in her data and learning and they can put in their BBT, they can use ovulation predictor kit, so they can put all that data into the platform. And then maybe they bring over the Aura or the Whoop um, API and they get that data overlaid. So then they have a really good sound and they could say, oh yeah, well, this temperature thing does kind of track or it doesn't track. But just as an individual wearable, it's not appropriate to be able to predict ovulation um, and yeah, and to predict periods. Mm. And in your view, view, like how could um, like this move forward? Like as like if we look at it from a woman's perspective, not like from the wearables mm -hmm. or like well, school, but like from a woman's perspective, like what is like the ideal scenario where she can. Yeah, just like have the tools and knowledge to perform and like what's what would she be using and how it would uh, work in an ideal world. So <clears throat> always taking the big rocks, right? So tracking your menstrual cycle and knowing how you feel across all your phases. That's the biggest thing. And then you can layer on sleep and then you layer on recovery. Those are the like three big things. But if you had to pick one in an ideal world, it's like you know where you are in your menstrual cycle and you are aware of how you feel in that particular day or phase. Because then you can make um, you know, on, on the fly decisions where you're like, oh gosh, day tw 20 of my cycle, they always feel, feel super flat. So it, there's this big event coming and I know I'm gonna be flat. So what kind of nutrition interventions or what can I do to kind of boost myself? But that's not gonna be appropriate for everybody. So it's just really that biohacking personalized stuff that you get so that you can make those own informed decisions. Then if we had to bring like full tech into it, if I like to have a platform of everything to be able to determine, I'd have the tracking and in the tracking, I'd have the availability to have basal body temperature in there. I would have been able to put in um, my results of an ovulation predictor kit. So your LH surge. So you have that for over the course of three months and then you then are able to make really sound decisions of what's going on. Yeah, and um, and also like women change all the time. They like they take contraceptive. So like, what right. what about the women who take a pill? Like, oh, not a pill, like any contraceptive actually. Right, and so when you're looking at well, IUD, copper IUD, or the Marina IUD, you still have your natural cycle. Mm. Um, copper IUD, you don't stop ovulating, but with the Marina, or Skylar, Keylar, the progestin only IUDs, eight months to a year after insertion most women start to ovulate again. So then you can track your cycle using BBT. Um, but if you have the depot, you have the implant, you're using oral contraceptive pill, you're using um, vaginal ring, all of these affect uh, your blood vessels because estrogen component um, is very tightly tied to endothelial function, which is you know your vasoconstriction and dilation control. So when you start having that and you have um, differences in internal temperature, the pill masks it, the depot masks it. So you don't really have any kind of fluctuation. Yep. And, uh, and then there's women in perimenopause and menopause. And they're all over the show, right? So perimenopause, yeah. you might have a 21 day cycle, then you might have a 40 day cycle and tracking PBT is another way that you can see what's happening. Um, and it's even more important when you're perimenopausal to track it from a temperature standpoint. So you can say, oh, I've had this estrogen surge and then I have my period, but I didn't have an increase in my temperature. So it must have been anovulatory. So you can kind of see, am I ovulating or not? Was it a normal cycle or was it an anovulatory cycle? Um, and the more you have anovulatory cycles, the closer you are to getting to that one point in time where your periods completely stop. So it's a way of tracking to mm -hmm. see how far into that perimenopause you are. And then with menopause, you don't have ovarian function. 
So you don't have fluctuations of estrogen, progesterone, so your temperature just kind of stays pretty flat, like, unfortunately, I'd say, like a man's. <laughs> ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. The holy grail, becoming a man. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So men try to to be like women. That's what it is. They, they are. Not, yes. They're not lucky enough to have all the powerhouse of our hormones. Exactly. No, but that's that's exactly like what we should consider. Like, I mean, it's incredible. The female body can every single month create a human from scratch. I know. And like everything is set and ready. Um, I know. And somehow we managed to uh, make people believe that women are made out of a rib of a man. I, I know incredible. it's crazy <laughs> like all yeah. marketing is incredible uh um, and, and women are weak and fragile little beings or we're not it's like incredible power machines i know with higher pain tolerance and yeah. ability to go longer and further yeah uh, but no we're the anomaly exactly uh and uh, what about uh women who have like 10 percent of women who have like endometriosis polycystic syndrome and like these very common like uh yeah, medical conditions yeah so like with pcos um there's a higher amount of testosterone that's being um aromatized and so that causes a lot of issue and you have a lot of ovarian dysfunction so Temperature definitely doesn't have any account on what's happening with P women who suffer from PCOS. Uh, we know that women with heavy menstrual bleeding and really bad um, premenstrual uh, disorders, so really, really bad PMS, they have fluctuations in their temperature that um, is greater than a woman who doesn't suffer from those things. Mm -hmm. So you have a higher upsurge of progesterone, you have a greater downward turn with the estrogen surge. So that's another way to, you know, say, oh, well, am I normal? What's going on? Heavy menstrual bleed. I have really bad PMS. So being able to track that and, and have some data to show your physician, then that's another way of having an arsenal to be like, I need some help here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, and then we have obviously like women who try to get pregnant. So like pre-pregnancies and like how they can understand better, like where they are in their cycle and how it's functioning well, or can be helped through behavior mm -hmm. nutrition and like pregnancies and postpartum. Like what, what are your thoughts on that? And like how we can optimize, help them better as well. Um, so when you're looking at the fertility aspect, a lot of people will take, um, the, um, texture of the mucus yeah. across the cycle as well as BBT. So then they can see when they're ovulating. So they do that for a couple of, of cycles and then they use the ovulation predictor. Yeah. Um, and so they're able to really dial in like, where is that fertility window? Or if you're um, on a professional athlete and you don't want to get pregnant, then you know the no-go window because you've been able to track and know when you're in that fertile window. Um, and then what was the second part to that? Uh, like pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, postpartum. Yeah, well, with postpartum um, and pregnancy, they're both two different hormonal, um, I guess, profiles. So pregnancy is completely different in its own right yeah. with all the different levels of estrogen. You have a different estrogen that comes into play too. Um, it's one of the weaker estrogens, but it's only produced during pregnancy. So you have a higher amount of estrogen. You have a higher amount of progesterone, you have oxytocin. So there's a whole different, uh, I guess, melange of, of hormones going on. And then the postpartum period, it takes a while for everything to kind of settle. And some women don't start having normal cycles for a year, which is pretty normal, eight months to a year after they give birth. But that doesn't mean they're not ovulating. So then that's why people are like, oh, Irish twins. So it's, it's a really interesting time period. Um, but if you don't start getting your periods back after a year, then we know there's some kind of energy misstep. Because um, a lot of women who are super active and they try to lose weight quickly after having a baby, they get into that low energy state. They, be, they maintain an amenorrheic state. And then, then they think that that's kind of normal because if they have, if this was their first pregnancy and their first postpartum period, um, yeah, so this is where I would want to pull in like continuous glucose monitor to see what's happening while they're sleeping. 
because yep. that would give us some insight of if they're in low energy or not. Yeah, it's so interesting the postpartum because uh, like it's often completely disregarded as in like you had a baby and now it's all normal. Whereas what I hear more and more is that it's, it's a massive, massive, like the body's entirely different. And um, totally, even right down to um, like your bike fit if you're a cyclist after you give birth your sits bones don't actually go back to where they were before if you give a vaginal have a vaginal birth mm. so you end up with a wider pelvis and so you have to change your bike seat and you have to change some of your pedaling mechanics and everything running as well right because now your running mechanics are different because your hips have widened a bit and they're not going to go back to where they were so people tend to get injured a lot because they don't take that into account and those are just small things that people don't talk about then we have the big things that happened the six weeks after birth that probably not appropriate for a recording. <laughs> but we can, totally you know, yeah, like they would tell you um, you have a vaginal birth because your pelvic floor muscles have been so stretched. It looks like that you're having prolapse and people don't tell you to expect that. They just say, oh, you'll have some bruising, but they don't actually tell you what you should look for and what is a prolapse and what isn't a prolapse and how long that should last. And the first three months, all the changes that should happen. And, you know, you walk out after having a baby, you still look like you're pregnant because your uterus hasn't shrunk. So there's all of these things that you don't know until you've gone through it because people don't talk about it. There are no books about it and, and physicians don't tell you about it because they kind of like, oh, you had the baby, you're healthy. Both of you are healthy. Sweet. Yeah, exactly. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye. We don't care about your mental health or anything else, and you can just be confused. It's all right. Yeah. Or yeah. urinary incontinences. Uh, all this reason women are like, very, very prone to have uh, after pregnancy. I know, and it can last for years. If like there are some women I've talked to, ten years after they had a kid, they're still having incontinence issues because they've never been taught to retrain their pelvic floor. Yeah. So it's a huge issue that no one talks about. Yeah. Yeah, um, so interesting, like so many layers that are like, like that women, m a lot of women go through and that's completely untouched. So hopefully we'll be able to help them. And because now there's like a lot of wearables. I mean, like I wear Aura, you will whoop, I, I will whoop as well. Um, and, uh, but there are a lot of other uh, people coming out, like as in uh, Amazon did something mm -hmm. that's, uh, um, that that seems to be quite similar to the, to the whoop band. Uh, the Fitbit obviously existed before. They just launched actually a, a jewelry kind of Fitbit for women. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's all like these wearables, but there there isn't like really one that is like for women active and like looking at all these variations of women. I know. It would be good. Mm. Can we get someone to develop one with a background of wild, and that we could just take over? That would yes. be awesome. That's uh, actually Sahana really wants that. I know. <laughs> all Me time, too. Like, why don't we have a wearable? Yeah. I know. Let's put it yeah. all together into one and be specific for women. And then when you sign up and you say, "I'm I'm premenopausal, naturally cycling," and then you get all this information. Yeah. I'm premenopausal using an OC, and you get this information. I'm trying for a kid. I just had a kid, so all of those things would go in, and you could put it in, and you would get so much information. It'd be awesome. Perfect. We'll work on that. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> no, but, but because because it's it's I mean it's incredible. Like wearable companies are it's very complicated to do wearable, but they still focus on men. So and then there's like add-ons, but that's mm -hmm. not really how you serve women. Like you need to like go from like the bottom up. Like what is a woman? Right. What do they need? What do they go through all the time? And then how can you do a wearable that serves them? The one thing of wearables that really drives me nuts, besides the temperature thing. Is oxygen saturation. I'm like, what, why? Why do you need to know what your oxygen sat is? We use it in research if we're going to put someone in an altitude chamber or doing dive research. But for the general person, they don't need to know what their oxygen sat is. So, like having it as a special feature, I'm like, what? Why? It just, oh, yeah. And it started with Apple, and all the other wearables have followed suit without really asking why. Mm. Interesting. I guess it might be an easy tracker to add. And then they're like, well, we have another tracker. It's cool. Yeah, but what does it tell you? Yeah. Nothing actionable on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah at least. Apple Watch, yeah. 
at least with the skin temperature, if you have that with heart rate variability, you can figure out, like you start feeling a bit flat and you can see that you're getting sick because yeah. your skin temperature changes with heart rate variability. But oxygen sat doesn't give you anything actionable. Mm. That's, that's my rant, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, amazing. Anything else that we should talk about, like wearables and women and how like that world can be bridged better? I, I agree with you with having to start from the ground up with the eye from a woman's lens, not a male lens. Mm -hmm. So like writing the algorithms for heart rate, heart rate variability, um, sleep metrics and how they change over the menstrual cycle. Um, taking all into account all of the um, differences in, across the lifespan for women, all of that needs to be like brought into focus. Because I also think about like perimenopausal women who are, I had this conversation last week on a board meeting talking about um, how perimenopausal women tend to be right at the peak or heading to the peak of their career. And then they get book ended with like older parents and younger kids and anxiety and stress that comes on from perimenopause is different and needs to be addressed differently than work stress. But all the protocols and things that tell you your stress and heart rate variability and all of those things are from the male algorithm. So it doesn't really empower a woman to know what to do or how to address it. So we yeah. need something from the ground up. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually, it's interesting because it became now, it's like a big topic in the workspace, like women in perimenopause and menopause being actually discriminated against because yep. The work environment hasn't considered that it's a massive change and shift. Um, yeah. yeah. And there are things that you could do for focus and cognition and vasomotor symptoms. But I read a lot of the stuff that's coming out from Europe on the workplace stuff because it hasn't really touched here in the States. And it still has a lot of negative language where I read an article about how people are like, oh, we need menopause leave. And it has this tainted like negative language around it. And I was like, that's not gonna help at all. You need to take it from ground up, have a woman talk about it, women write it, write the policy, everything. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean, and that's, that's the other thing that really crazy is like how, the, how negative the image is on everything that women go through. Or is it annoying? You're gonna get pregnant, and then you go back to work. How are you managing it? And then um, you have like all these pains, and you're moody and bitchy, and you have menopause. It's like the end of uh, being a woman, of womanhood, because right. you. I know. And like, it's like no, it's not like every single woman is gonna go through that. So surely there is another way to interpret it, um, right? Because otherwise it's, it's pretty bad, and uh, and it shouldn't be. I know. Well, even the kid thing, you have all the negativity about, oh, well, you're pregnant. I remember going through some job interviews when I was pregnant and I didn't let them know because of the fear of they, I wouldn't get hired if, I, if they knew I was pregnant. And then you see like in academic scope, so many women don't make the top end of professor because they've had time out to have a kid and they haven't been able to catch up with publications. It's across everything. It's just, yeah, it's still such a male driven society and they don't take anything into account. Just yeah, and, uh, and yeah, just like just tracking peers doesn't help massively women. Uh, yeah. like there's just the tip of the iceberg of a of a right. big thing, which is what is a woman and what does the female body need. Right, right. Cool. Um, amazing. A lot of good information. 